This video was sponsored by Campfire. No relation to the s'mores incident. Okay, I can explain. This is one of the tropes with a weirder name, but as soon as I start describing it, you're gonna get the picture. You know that thing where in order to show that two characters have a storied history together packed with hijinks and shenanigans, they'll start talking about some thing that happened off screen, and they'll be vague about it because they were both there and know what happened, so they aren't just gonna drop any convenient as you knows for the audience's benefit. So it's basically like an in-joke they aren't sharing with us. You've 100% seen this before. This is the you and I remember Budapest very differently thing. A noodle incident is a wacky hijink that the characters reference but do not explain, and often if pressed for explanation, they get defensive or change the subject so the mystery is preserved. A noodle incident might even become a running gag if enough characters bring it up, but it'll always be through hints and tidbits, usually focused on the characters' emotional reactions and not the specific events they're reacting to. In general, all we know about the noodle incident is how the characters feel about it and one or two pertinent details about the most relevant nouns in the key event. This trope is very widespread, and it's an interesting little nugget because it's storytelling by way of implication. And on paper, it feels a little bit wrong or empty to have a character hint at some exciting past adventure and then not show it. It's a joke that implies a punchline rather than having a punchline. And I've previously complained about stories that imply they're doing something exciting or clever and then fail to live up to it, like implying they've plotted out some grand and complicated mystery that ends up not having a grand resolution. And when laid out in the broadest strokes, this feels like another case of that. But it isn't, because in this case, the fact that the noodle incident is never explained is the entire point of the bit. The trope is called the noodle incident because of a running gag in Calvin and Hobbes, where it is repeatedly implied that Calvin did something horrible involving noodles that had the potential to get him put on Santa's naughty list. Bill Watterson decided against ever explaining what the noodle incident was because nothing he came up with would be funnier than what the audience imagined. This principle of comedy is basically the funny haha version of the horror movie principle of not showing the monster. The terror the audience imagines from the tiny hints of danger and the overwhelming power of the unknown is always scarier than whatever the special effects department could rustle up. And the noodle incident is the comedy invocation of this same idea. The line between comedy and horror is thinner than either genre would like it to be, and this means that if a writer plants the right set of hints, they can cue the audience into entertaining themselves by contemplating the implications of what the story is hiding from them. In the case of horror, the hints are danger and fear. Unexplained noises, movement in dark corners, threats in places you thought were safe. In comedy, the hints are absurdities. The phrase, the noodle incident, tells you nothing except that it was an incident that involved noodles. We can put on our Sherlock Holmes deerstalkers for a minute and infer that whatever role noodles played in the incident was more prominent than any other participating element in order to get the incident named after noodles, but really all that tells us is the incident was probably food being used in a manner inappropriate for food. Calvin made a mess is nowhere near as funny as contemplating the implied horror of what he could have possibly done that could only be described as the noodle incident. Noodle incidents are very efficient at communicating information, but it's pointedly not the information about what the noodle incident was. Noodle incidents are not about what happened. It's the way they are talked about and described that's basically a character characterization speed run. For one thing, they flesh out a character's backstory and make it clear to the audience that they have adventures in a life off screen and aren't just chained to the camera 24-7, which does a lot to make them feel more alive. But the bulk of the information the audience gets from a noodle incident comes from how the characters act when they're talking about it. The way they react to the sparse, vague hints we get gives us a ton of information about the character. They describe or briefly flash back to an unknown incident in their past, and how they choose to describe it or not describe it tells us something about them. Maybe they're speaking really casually about about something that's implied to have been a very dangerous scenario, implying that they are ridiculously badass and blasé about the dangers in their life. Or maybe they're bragging about something they pulled off in a very self-aggrandizing way that sounds suspiciously exaggerated, implying that they're kind of a glory hound. Or maybe they're acting very mildly annoyed about some vaguely defined grievance that sounds absolutely bizarre, which tells us that they're way too acclimated to some really weird shit. Or maybe they keep starting a story they're clearly passionate about and getting shut down, making it clear that the people around them aren't being particularly considerate of them right now. And on that note, the way their fellow characters react to them referencing the noodle incident gives us even more information. A character who reacts to a noodle incident reference with extreme defensiveness was probably the butt of the joke, whatever the joke was. A character might shut down the conversation because they've heard about the noodle incident too many times, making it clear that somebody in the group really likes talking about it. This kind of thing can play out in so many different ways, and because it's basically just free-form dialogue that the writer can drop in anywhere there's a quiet moment, it's really narratively efficient for getting across characterization in a very short span of 
time. One show that does this a lot is Leverage, which seems to have gone out of its way to deliberately leave a lot of the characters' adventures off-screen to make them feel like complex people who've lived exciting lives. In the very first episode, it's mentioned that former insurance investigator Nate has personally chased down every other main character at least once, and those adventures are never ever shown in anything more than a few seconds of out-of-context flashbacks. You'd think the first time the characters met back when they were still on opposite sides would be kind of an important story beat, but it isn't. None of the characters care to bring it up when they could be focusing on new adventures instead. Showing a flashback to a first meeting wouldn't really add anything to the story. And the formula for later episodes follows a similar principle of only hinting at events between episodes or backstory bits by showing or telling us out-of-context goofs. We'll get little bite-sized flashbacks of Parker throwing Hardison off a building or Elliot getting waterboarded or something, and when it flashes back to the present, the way the characters react makes it pretty clear that all of these things are very normal for them and not really worth dwelling on, although their friends might disagree. And it might sound like these are stories the audience might be curious about seeing in the actual show, but what makes the balance of leverage work is that these noodle incidents are pretty much par for how the actual episodes go. We never really feel like we're being cheated out of the Parker Steals the Stanley Cup episode because we've got like seven seasons of stuff exactly like that. The noodle incidents just make it feel like there's more show happening in the background of the show. In horror movies, the scariness of the story often takes a rapid downturn after the monster is fully revealed for the first time. Sometimes this has to do with special effects not holding up, but mostly it's just from the simple fact that almost all fear is grounded in the unknown, and once the audience gets a clear, good look at the danger, it's not unknown anymore. It can still be scary, but it won't be as scary as it was when the audience was imagining it as their own personal worst nightmare. Alien is straight up terrifying until the very last scene, which is also the first time we get a clear, bright shot of the alien in question, and it becomes very apparent that it's a guy in a well-made suit. Thankfully, the reveal is saved till the very end, and on rewatches, the movie still holds up if you know what the alien looks like, but it takes away some of the highly specific horror of how well it blends into the environment, and how the characters have no idea what to look for when it gets big. And Noodle Incidents face the comedy equivalent of the same thing, because despite the fact that Noodle Incidents are entirely built on not explaining the joke, some stories do anyway. And this explanation usually happens because not all Noodle Incidents are actually funny. For instance, sometimes characters reference serious Noodle Incidents to highlight how badass they are, either by bragging about some vaguely defined accomplishment or referencing some vaguely horrifying element of their formative tragic backstory. A character with a storied and exciting past full of too many adventures to ever show can pretty much always allude to some exciting and cool thing they did one time, and as long as it lines up with the competence the audience has actually seen from them in the episodes that did get made, it feels like a plausible noodle incident without needing clarification. Of course, you also get cases where a character brags about stuff they did off-screen that doesn't really line up with their actual on-screen characterization, which might indicate that this character is lying or exaggerating, or that the writers are hiding all the exciting adventures in the off-screen zone for some reason. But tragic backstory noodle incidents are in kind of a weird zone. Comedic noodle incidents, as discussed, are basically a funny invocation of a horror trope, storytelling by implication to let the audience fill in the gaps with their own imagination, without bogging down the story with too many lengthy explanations. In fact, since a lot of comedy is built on characters being distressed, a comedic noodle incident might be played for laughs, but actually be describing an event that sounds unpleasant at best and horrific at worst. And if a writer takes those implications and plays them straight, they get tragic noodle incidents which invert the horror to comedy inversion and loop back around to just being horror tropes. If a character briefly and vaguely alludes to something they went through that sounds tragic or nightmarish, it serves the same purpose as a typical noodle incident, providing a highly dense chunk of characterization just through the way the character refers to the event without ever having to specify what went down. And it signals to the audience how this character feels about their backstory and how much they want to share. For instance, in typical noodle incident fashion, if they never clarify or they shut down follow-up questions, it might indicate that this slice of backstory is, rather reasonably, a sore spot they don't want to talk about too much. But unlike a typical comedic noodle incident, these more serious teases of emotionally nuanced backstory elements might actually invite a clear explanation. A dark or upsetting element of somebody's backstory could potentially be important and require that the character actually tell the audience what specifically happened. Sometimes these reveals even reframe a noodle incident that previously seemed lighthearted and comedic by revealing that the vagueness of the references to it were concealing the real emotional weight of what went down. If a noodle incident is hiding an actual plot-relevant event, it kind of has to eventually get cracked open and explained. But this is pretty rare. Most noodle incidents are jokes that don't need to be explained, and like all jokes, would be less funny if they were explained. This actually segues into an interesting tangential principle that applies to a lot of stories, which I like to call, fans don't actually know what they want from their stories. The entire core principle of a noodle incident is that it gives the audience just enough information for them to speculate and extrapolate what might have happened. Whether that extrapolation is in the dimension of comedy or horror depends on the planting and how the characters frame it. By its very nature, a noodle incident piques the audience's interest and makes them wonder what happened. But foundational in the trope is the simple fact that the audience's loose speculation is more entertaining for them than a 
clear explanation would be. Essentially, this trope entertains an audience by making them wonder what happened. But if the audience then asks the storyteller what really happened, and the story decides to tell them, the wave function collapses into certainty and all that fun speculation and comedic vagueness goes away. The noodle incident just becomes a little flashback within the story. And this has confused storytellers. The fans spent so much time clamoring to know what happened, and then we showed them and they seemed disappointed. This is kind of what screwed over Solo A Star Wars Story, a completely passable movie whose entire purpose was explaining every single noodle incident Han Solo referenced in the original trilogy. It lays down in canon exactly what he was talking about when he said they did the Kessel Run, or that Chewie hangs out with him because he owes him a life debt, or that he won the Falcon from Lando in a game, and you can almost hear the writer's room clapping themselves on the back because they think figured out how to give the audience the fan service they demand, because fans have been speculating about the Kessel Run for decades. Won't it be so good for them to finally see it? And we can finally stick it to those people who keep pointing out that a parsec is a unit of distance by explaining how that actually made sense all along. People are gonna love this movie. After all, it's what they've been asking for for years. Solo kind of heralded the current era of Star Wars content, where everything feels pretty intensely focus grouped to give fans what they think fans want from playing to the averages, and that means every time they explain a noodle incident, it ends up being basically the average explanation. Solo is a movie with no surprises except for how good that one explosion looked. And I probably liked that movie more than most people. I mean, for one thing, I actually watched it, which is already kind of a big step. And for ages, the best thing I'd had to say in its defense is that it's exactly what I expected it to be. It hits every beat you'd expect from a Han Solo origin story. He checks off every box from his backstory, has a gunfight where he shoots first, gets all his equipment in order, and flies off into the sunset with all the the stars going whoosh. We even get to see Chewie rip a guy's arms off. On paper, this is a nice and tidy way to give fans the answers to every question they've been asking since Han first rocked up on the silver screen in 1977. There's only one problem. A gold-hearted street smart scoundrel like Han Solo should not be a character with all his questions answered. He's had a long and complicated life causing problems and getting into scrapes. The reason he has so many noodle incidents in the first trilogy is because he's had the most convoluted life out of our trio of protagonists when contrasted with Princess on a Mission and Farm Boy who's never left his zip code. And this is signaled by him constantly referencing things that he and Chewie have done in a way that implies he's been doing a lot of stuff. The fact that we don't know his whole story and he's been up to a lot of sketchy shenanigans is kind of foundational to his vibes. And it makes the twist of his character work where he shockingly does not abandon the good guys and instead gets himself in a lot of trouble doing the right thing for once. Han is a pretty simple character and he's written pretty efficiently in the original trilogy. And the fact that there's a lot of vagueness in his backstory is a feature of his archetype, not a bug to be corrected. Now, when Han mentions the Kessel Run, the audience doesn't go, ooh, the Kessel Run, that sounds interesting and space related. He must have gotten up to a lot of fun high-speed adventures. They go, oh yeah, I remember that part of the movie with the thing that lives near black holes but isn't immune to black holes. The noodle incident trope illustrates one of the more counterintuitive parts of storytelling, and one of the parts that I personally have had the most trouble internalizing. Sometimes it's better to not explain something. The bones of the story need to be pretty solid. Setup, payoff, key backstory elements, explanation to hyped up mysteries, but outside of that core space, there's a lot of room for vagueness and flexibility and implication. Noodle incidents are characterization tropes. What happens in them almost never matters. It's how the characters feel and talk about them that's the real meat of this trope. To drop in a quick MCU example, one of Nick Fury's most interesting lines back in the earlier phases was, last time I trusted someone, I lost an eye. Nick Fury's eye patch is an iconic part of his character design, but up to this point, it's never really been focused on or addressed directly in the movies. And Nick Fury is not the kind of person to volunteer information that isn't need to know. So when he drops that little tidbit, the takeaway isn't, oh man, I wonder what specifically happened to make him lose that eye. It's, oh man, so Nick Fury has been profoundly betrayed by somebody he trusted in a way that literally scarred him for life, which is probably part of why he's so ridiculously cautious and overprepared. He sure has been through a lot of stuff that tempered him into the ludicrous badass he is today, somebody who would never make that mistake again. It's a characterization cue. No explanation for his missing eye was gonna have the same impact on the audience as just hearing him talk about it. And especially, especially not the explanation they actually gave us. And that's actually pretty illustrative of this point. When they finally showed us how Nick Fury lost that eye, it was a joke. And it tacitly disproved all those juicy characterization implications we'd inferred from that first reference. Profound betrayal shaping the young Nick Fury, a reminder of his own past weakness staring him in the face every time he looked in the mirror. Now all we get from it is that he probably doesn't like cats very much. A noodle incident is basically narrative sleight of hand. It looks like it's showing the audience a fun hint of a hidden adventure, but through the execution of that hint, it's actually teaching the audience what kind of 
of person the character is. And then, if the writer decides they want to show how the trick was done, the trick stops working. There's a lot of merit to leaving things loose and unresolved when it comes to character backstories. If it's not foundational to the comprehension of the story, it doesn't need to be set in stone. We don't need to see exactly what Han Solo did to piss off Jabba the Hutt. The only part that matters for the story is that he did piss off Jabba the Hutt, and now our heroes need to deal with the consequences. And when we examine this uncertainty principle, a term that definitely has no other more confusing meanings, we can loop this back to horror again. At the end of the horror movie The Thing, when the Arctic base has burned down and the creature has theoretically been destroyed, there are only two survivors left, protagonist McCready and Engineer Childs, who had previously disappeared and was presumed dead, but claims to have just gotten lost in the storm. Given the whole conceit of The Thing, it is entirely possible that that is not Childs. Hell, if you squint, it's technically also possible that that's not McCready. The ending is brutally ambiguous. Maybe our two human survivors have a chance of making it. Or maybe the only human survivor is about to die in some horrible way, and the thing in question is just going to freeze itself into hibernation again. There's tons of theories and speculation about it, but fundamentally, it doesn't have an answer. That's what makes it work. No explanation would be as effective as the impact of not having an explanation. I do feel the need to go off script and clarify just a little bit that it takes work to create a story wherein no explanation would be as satisfying as the impact of not having an explanation. Because this is like the root of that mystery box form of storytelling that I think is absolute bullshit because it's like, if you're telling a mystery, the entire point of the story is the resolution of the mystery. That is pointedly not a case where a lack of explanation is more impactful than an explanation. If it's a mystery, we want to see it solved. Okay, that's it. I'm done. We're good. Bye. So yeah. <laughs> And thanks again to Campfire for sponsoring this video. If you've ever read a book and thought, man, I wish there was more book in this book, then I have excellent news about Campfire's new Reader Mobile app. You may be familiar with Campfire for their writing and world building software for authors, but now they're bringing all those bells and whistles to readers too, in a platform where anyone can go to read all that good writing the writers have worked so hard on. Fans of all genres can find stories they'll love, and with 80% royalties going to the writers, Campfire is a very good way to support your favorite authors. As you read through a story on Campfire, you'll unlock exclusive bonuses like short stories and world lore fleshing out the broader space of the story, and immerse yourself in a panoply of bonus content like interactive maps, character profiles, family trees, story timelines, and all the behind-the-scenes insights you could want from the writers. That's significantly more book per book. And on top of all that, since Campfire just released a mobile app, readers can get to all that goodness while on the go. So if all that sounds interesting, check out the link in the description to find your next read on Campfire and have a grand old time.